today from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 15. Again, these are the words of the living God. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. You may be seated. Father, we come into your presence now to be instructed by you. I pray that you would remove all distractions from our midst so that we can hear you speaking clearly to us through the preached word. God, that you would help me to get out of the way so that your people can hear from you. God, that you would uh, come powerfully in our midst and anoint this time together so that we can think clearly about the issues so that we can think about the things that the Holy Spirit is applying to our hearts and be changed by them, be changed by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ and all that you've come to do in the world through it. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. You ever go on vacation and, uh, leave something behind, and then afterwards you call back down there to the the hotel, and you tell them about it, and you tell them where uh, you were, and you give them their uh, your number, and they say what? We'll look into it, and we'll get back to you, right? And then they hang up the phone, and you're like, they're, they're not going to look into it, right? <laughs> or you leave your wallet in the bathroom at the convenience store, and you call down there, and the clerk says, hold on, let me look in, let me go look into that for you, and he Gets back on the phone, sounding a little squirrely. Says, nope, it's not here. <laughs> right? Or, some of you, I know that you do this, uh, you call down there to the government agencies to share your latest conspiracy theories with them, and what do they say? Well, look into it. And then they hang up the phone on you, right? They're not, they're not going to look into it. Um, today, in our passage, uh, we are going to see that in the Scripture, uh, God has called us to look into all that he has done for us in Jesus. But here is the problem. In our sin, oftentimes we don't do that. We refuse to look into it. We could care less. We ignore it. And a lot of times we outright reject it. Okay? So I want to look at this idea of looking into uh, Jesus and all that he has done for us uh, in two ways this morning. The first Uh, is, and and they're both in connection with the resurrection. The first is that God has uh, raised Jesus from the dead, therefore we are to look into the resurrection of Christ in worship and life, okay? So we look into it in worship and in life. The second is like it, God has raised Jesus from the dead, therefore we are to look to him as Savior and Lord of all, okay? So we look to him as Savior and Lord of all. Uh, That first point is uh, found back there in uh, verses 1 through 10. I'm not going to uh, rehearse uh, the whole thing for you, uh, but one thing that I uh, want us to note when we are looking at this section here is that just prior to this, 
uh, the chief priest uh, and the Pharisees have just gone to the governor, who at that time was Pilate, under whom Jesus was executed, and asked if there could be a, uh, a guard of armed men placed at the tomb of Jesus uh, in case some of the disciples wanted to come and try to steal the body away and claim that he had been raised from the dead, okay? You may remember last week that I told you that these guys, these religious leaders were willing to do anything to stop people from following Jesus, to discourage people uh, from following uh, Jesus. Um, uh, they were even willing to kill somebody in order for that to happen. You may remember that they were plotting to kill Lazarus because people were following Jesus because he had raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, Jesus had said that if you kill me, uh, well, let's put it like this. If Jesus said, if you kill me, I'll come back from the dead, okay, and he actually did, don't you think that that would get people interested? That might catch on a little bit, right? And Jesus did say that, and the religious leaders couldn't have this, okay? Jesus told the Jews already, if you destroy this temple, referring to his body, in three days he would uh, raise it up. And so the religious leaders here at this point are willing to go to great lengths to ensure that nobody uh, continues to follow this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And so this is why you have the guard of armed men at the tomb of Jesus making sure no funny business takes place, right? So what does God do? He sends an angel and an earthquake from heaven to discredit their ridiculous efforts to try to suppress the knowledge of the truth of the resurrection of a Jesus Christ, right? He sends this earthquake with this angel, and then the tomb opens up, right? And there's no Jesus, right? All just to say, look, <laughs> even a tomb made out of stone with a boulder in front of it can't stop him, right? And he sends the angel along with it to tell the truth to everybody about what had happened. And the text tells us when the guards saw this angel that they fell down like dead men, okay? Some of us might have fallen down like dead men too if we had saw of the angel. Now, there's question about what happened here. Did they faint or were they just paralyzed with fear? Uh, nevertheless, they were utterly incapacitated while the angel tells the women the truth about Jesus Christ, while he tells them uh, the story of his victory. Uh, look at verses 5 and 6 with me, if you would. We'll go back and read that again. Chapter 28, verse 5, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So, the thing that I want to hone in on here is uh, what he tells them to do and their response. You see the response there uh, in verse 8. So, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. So, what is the first thing that he tells them to do? He says, come and see the place where his body is lay. Come and see the place where his body lay. That is, come and look into the resurrection of Jesus. What is, he, what is he asking them to do? We'll see the place where his body laid. We'll see the place where his dead body was lying prior to this. And so he's effectively telling them that this is no trick of your imagination. This man has really 
been raised from the dead. In John's gospel, we read that the cloth that Jesus was wrapped in was lying there, but Jesus wasn't. So what is the point? Well, this was a real man who died a real death with a he, he's, a, he's a real man with a real soul, a real body, real flesh, real bones like me and you. Died a real death with real nails and real blood, and now his body's not here. This is a resurrection. This is a real resurrection. There was once a dead body laying here, but not anymore. Okay? That is the point that he is driving that. Um, so this is what he tells them to do. Next, he tells them to go. He tells the disciples to go and tell his disciples. So he tells the women, go tell uh, the followers of Jesus that he has been raised from the dead and go to Galilee and you will see him there. Okay, so what has just happened here? There's been a transfer of the message, right? The message of the resurrection of Jesus from the angels to the women. And what does he tell them to do? Go and tell his disciples quickly about this. And what do the women do? Do they, do they go and stop at their friends' houses? Do they, do they go out and do some shopping? No. They, the text tells us that they literally ran to go and tell the disciples what had happened. So these women were obedient to the message. I would imagine it happened almost instantaneously. They hear it, and then they go. They're immediately obedient uh, to what he tells them to do. And that is the point that I'm driving at. They follow the command of the angel, right? They are immediately obedient to the call from heaven, if you will, okay? Okay. <clears throat> And what happens as soon as they are obedient to the message? Boom, they run into Jesus, right? Right? Jesus, Jesus comes to confirm the message of his resurrection to them. He says, greetings, or hello. <laughs> that must have been a shocker, right? Uh, here they have just been greeted by a dead man, right? Keep in mind... These women came to anoint the dead body of Jesus, right? They, they had seen him crucified. They had seen him laid in the grave. And now he is standing before them alive and well. And so what is their response? Worship, right? Immediately they fall down and worship him, which is the only reasonable response, right? Right? Jesus claimed to be Savior, and he claimed to be Lord, and he proved that it was all true by rising from the dead, right? Who is this man over whom death has no power? Well, it can be none other than the Lord of heaven and earth. And so these women worship. These women worship. That is their response. Now, what the angel told them to do here and their response is just as applicable to those of us who are living today as it was to them then, okay? What does he tell them to do? He tells them to look into the resurrection of Jesus, right? Come see the place where his body lay. How do we do that today? How do we look into the resurrection of Jesus Christ today? Well, you're doing that right now, okay? When we come in here on Sunday morning, week in and week out, we are looking into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ around here every single week. Did you know that? Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Because of the resurrection, we do what we do, okay? And so whenever we come in here and we sing songs of praise to God, we are looking into the resurrection of Jesus, right? When, 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 the ministry, when you hear the Word of God preached and the ministry of the Word of God comes to bear upon your life, you're looking into the resurrection of Christ. When we pray prayers to God, listen to this, the only reason that God hears our prayers is because we pray them through the resurrected one. Do you see that? 
okay? When, when we sit down to eat and drink here at the Lord's table, we are eating and drinking with the resurrected Christ, right? So how do you do it? You have to be a part of a church, right? You have to be part of the church. You have to regularly be involved in the life of the church where the power, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is being manifested on a regular basis. But even more than that, when we go out of here on Sunday morning and back into our lives and we learn more about Jesus Christ and we study more about Jesus Christ, we are looking into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then when we go out there into the world and serve Christ with our hands and our feet and our mouths and our hearts, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is being manifested in our lives. Um, So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is everything. It is absolutely everything to the Christian because you see, Because of the resurrection, we are everything that we will ever be, and without the resurrection, we are nothing, okay? If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, you can kiss your faith goodbye, okay? Because what we're doing here this morning is an absolute lie, and it's all in vain. If he has not been raised from the dead. But here's the thing, he has been raised from the dead, and because of that, everything changes. Therefore, what is, there, what is our response supposed to be? The same as theirs. Worship and serve. Worship and serve, right? Same thing they did. Worship and serve. We worship him on Sunday uh, when we come into church week in and week out, and then we worship him with our lives as we go out there into the world serving him, telling other people about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? We are to tell people to behold this marvelous mystery, right? God sent Jesus into the world to save us from our sins. And he came and he died and he rose again. He has been resurrected and he has now been made Lord of all, you see? And and so, not only do we go out there and tell people about it, but we must bring our lives into accord with it. Our lives themselves should be living, breathing testimonies to the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead because we have been raised from the dead too, and along with him, and so we should be changed people, right? We're resurrected in the resurrection of Jesus, and so... Even just our lives out there in the world should be a testimony to this fact, right? We bear witness to this truth in the way that we live our lives, constantly telling other people all that God has done for us in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and saying, look, he can do it for you too, right? Look into the resurrection of Christ. Look at how he changed me. He can change you, right? And so... It is in life and in worship, right? In our words, in our speech, in the message that we preach, in the story that we believe, in the things that we do, in all that we are, we are bearing witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it starts here. It starts here every Sunday morning. This is the place where it begins, where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ week in and week out. Okay? So... God has raised Jesus from the dead, therefore we are to look into the resurrection of Christ in worship and life. We see that second point, God has raised Jesus from the dead, therefore we are to look to him as Savior and Lord of all in 11 through 15. Let's go ahead and read that again to get it before us. While they were going, behold... Some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people 
his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Okay, so back to these guards, right? It, it is interesting that it says some of the guards went to go tell them what happened. Well, what happened to the rest of them? Well, I don't know. Maybe they got converted and started following Jesus. I don't know, okay? But these other guards, they go and perform their duty, and so they go to tell the religious leaders what had happened. Why did they go to the religious leaders? Well, because that is who they have been commissioned by to do this. And so they go and tell them, look, an angel came out of heaven with an earthquake, and the tomb opened up, and Jesus wasn't there. Now, uh, as I said, the religious leaders can't have this, okay? The religious leaders want to continue to exercise power and authority over the people so that they can continue to extort them and take advantage of them. And if, these, if the people start looking to, if they stop looking to them and start looking to Jesus, they can't do that, okay? So they have to do something uh, about it. So here they have a credible account. <clears throat> um, well, let, let me say this first. Um, I said this a moment ago, but as we saw last week, these folks were even willing to kill people to discourage the crowds from following Jesus. And here it is no different. They are willing to lie and to bribe in order to discourage people from following Jesus. Um, and this shouldn't surprise us because they have just had Jesus murdered <laughs> so that people will stop following him. And so nothing is beneath them here at this point. And so what I want you to focus in on here is what these people are willing to do to deny that Jesus is who he says he is. Look at what great lengths these people are willing to go to in order to deny that Jesus is who he says he is. Here they have a credible account from the soldiers of what has happened, and the body of Jesus is missing. And so at this moment, they are faced with a choice, right? They either embrace Jesus as Lord and acknowledge that he is who he said he was, or they reject him and refuse to believe that he is Lord, right? And I, and I think that most of you know that they chose the latter, right? Uh, first, I want you to notice, well, we're going to look at both responses, but I want you to notice the response of the religious leaders and then the response of the soldiers, okay? So first, the response of the religious leaders. In order to suppress the truth of Jesus Christ, they are willing to pay money and even lie to make this all go away. Look at verse 12. Uh, it says, and when they had assembled with the elders and taking counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. Um, so what do they do? <laughs> They pay these people to tell a ridiculous lie. And I, and I hope you can see how ridiculous and inconsistent this lie is just even on the surface. They tell them to tell people that the disciples came and stole the body away while they were sleeping. How would they know that the disciples came and stole the body away if they were sleeping? You see? It's, it's absolutely ludicrous, but this is what great lengths the unbelieving world is willing to go through to suppress 
the truth of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they say, don't worry if the governor finds out about it. If Pilate finds out, we'll take care of him too, right? I mean, I guess they were willing to bribe him or, or do whatever to make this all go away. <clears throat> Next, I want to look at the response of the soldiers. So there's the response of the religious leaders. They are willing to lie uh, and even bribe people so that they do not have to submit to the lordship of Jesus. Even lying to themselves. They know this isn't true, I think. <clears throat> Maybe they didn't. Maybe they're just wholly deceived. But nevertheless, they are willing to lie in order to do this and bribe people uh, uh, in order to make it happen. Uh, the response of the soldiers is there in 15a. Look at uh, the first part. So they took the money. This is the soldiers. So they took the money and did as they were directed. They took the money and did as they were directed. Okay, so here are these men, right, who have just had this miraculous experience. They have seen the supernatural being come out of heaven. They have seen the earthquake. They have seen the empty tomb. And they have probably even heard the rumors that Jesus said that he would rise from the dead, okay? But what do they do here? They are willing to deny all of that and ignore all of that and trade Jesus Christ for some money, okay? They would rather have the things of this world than the truth of Jesus Christ. And this is just what unbelieving men do in their sin, okay? And this is oftentimes what we do in our sin. We would rather suppress the truth of Jesus and have our sins instead, okay? We would rather deny the truth of Jesus and have our lust instead. We would rather satisfy our desires instead. Uh, the last thing I want to note is uh, the this, this story there at the end, verse 15. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Uh, so apparently this story caught on <laughs> that they went and told, right? Matthew, when he writes this uh, gospel years later, people were still uh, saying that the disciples had come and taken the body of Jesus away and claim that he had been raised from the dead. And even Justin Martyr uh, in the uh, second century said in his day that people were still telling this ridiculous story. And it should not surprise us, <laughs> should it? Because people are still willing to believe ridiculous things contrary to the evidence today, all so that they can continue to have their sinful life and live uh, the sinful way that they want to. Um, let's ask ourselves for a moment, what are some of the things that people believe today? Still, uh, you know, you'll hear people say, well, the Bible is a myth, right? The Bible is inconsistent. Uh, it was written by men. And there are, it, it just goes on and on and on. And there are legitimate, valid Christian answers to all of these objections, just as there were in the days of Jesus. But, I mean, the most reasonable thing, if you looked at the evidence in the days of Jesus, was that he had been raised from the dead, right? But people do not want to believe that. People do not want to accept that because this is why. If Jesus is who he said he was, then that means that he is Lord. And if Jesus is Lord, that means that we are accountable to him, and people don't like that. People don't like that, okay? They would rather have their sin, but yet people still make these ridiculous excuses for not following Jesus today. Um, even people who are so-called Christians uh, make up these ridiculous excuses. I talk to people all the time who claim to be Christians 
who say that they don't have any time for that Jesus stuff. Okay? They don't have any time for church, and they tell me, this is what they tell me, they believe. They believe, and that's the only thing that matters. Well, I think we need to be careful with that. I think we need to be careful not to become like the religious leaders who lied to themselves so that they did not have to submit to Jesus, right? Because you do know people still suppress the truth of Jesus today, right? They still suppress the knowledge of the truth. When God reveals the truth of Jesus to them, they hold it down, right? You know, and I talk to people all the time and say, you know, I just don't, I don't have time for uh, Jesus. I don't have time for church. And they're busy with all this other stuff, right? They've got all these other commitments in their life. They're pursuing their career. They're pursuing money. Uh, they're pursuing a relationship. Uh, they're pursuing all this other stuff, right? But I think what we have to do, again, is be careful not to become like the soldiers who were willing to trade Jesus for some stuff, right? The soldiers were willing to trade Jesus for some money or some stuff. And I think oftentimes we are willing to trade Jesus for stuff. Oftentimes we're so wrapped up in ourselves and so wrapped up in ourselves that we don't give ourselves enough time to think about the things that matter the most. Listen, friends. If Jesus has been raised from the dead, then he is who he said he was. Okay? And if he is who he said he was, then that means that he is Lord, and therefore there are certain claims that he has upon your life. Simple as that. If you are a Christian, you have certain obligations uh, to Jesus Christ. And if you want to become a Christian, there are certain obligations that you are going to have to him. And you can't just say, I'm too busy for that right now. You know, I'm too busy with life, or I'll get to that thing later on. Because Jesus is Lord right now. See? Now, he may not be your Lord, but that doesn't change the fact that he is Lord. You see that? Jesus is Lord regardless of whether we acknowledge it or not. He is Lord. That is a fact. And we may not acknowledge it, but that doesn't change the fact that He is Lord. What it means is that we just have a different master. All it means is that you have a different master. You see? Because as I said last week, Lordship is inevitable. Lordship is inevitable. Jesus is Lord, and if you will not have him as Lord, someone or something else will be your Lord, right? And so what do we oftentimes do? We trade Jesus for all of this other stuff, right? And we pursue these other things instead of him. So I think what we have to ask ourselves here today, after all of this has been said, ask yourself today, what lies have you been believing so that you do not have to submit yourself to Jesus Christ? What are some of those lies? Um... Have you been rejecting invitations to come to church, to come back to church, to be a part of the church, to serve in the church? Um, have you been telling yourself this lie, that if you submit yourself to Jesus, he'll steal all your joy. He's going to ruin your party, right? You're not going to have any fun if you submit to Jesus, right? Right? You won't be able to do all of this other stuff that you want to do. 
I think ultimately what we have to ask ourselves at the end of the day, friends, is where is our allegiance at? Where is our allegiance at? Who are our commitments to? Because if Jesus is Lord and we belong to Him, then everything that we are and everything that we do is to be redefined by the relationship that we have with Him. Okay? Jesus came to set us free from from fear and from bondage and from death, right? He came to conquer our sins, to conquer all of our greatest enemies. And He has done that, and He is now Lord, and He invites us to come and rule over those things along with Him, okay? So, I think the question we have to ask ourselves today is what are some of those things that we can put on the altar, right? What are, what are some of those things that have been holding us back from following Jesus, right? What are some of those things that we can just put them up there on the altar and kiss them goodbye and say, I'm no longer a slave to those things, I'm a slave to Jesus, and in Him I'm truly free because He is Lord of all. So what are some of those things? What are some of the things that we have been trading Jesus for in our lives? What are some of the things that we have committed ourselves to above Him? What are some of the things that we have put in place of Him? What are some of the things that we have said are obligations, but they're really no obligations at all? They're just excuses. What are some of the lies that we have been telling ourselves? What are some of those things? Today, right now, in your heart, you can put them on the altar before God and kiss them goodbye. Say, I'm all done with them. I don't want anything to do with these things anymore. I want to serve the resurrected Christ. I want Him to be Lord of my life. I don't want to be a slave anymore. I'm a slave to these things. I'd rather be a slave to Him. Because in Him I'm truly free, since He's Lord of all. And again, He invites us to rule over everything with Him. So which one is it? Slavery or Jesus? Slavery to self, slavery to your stuff, or slavery to Christ, the Lord of all, who's good and merciful and kind, and who's powerful and able to deliver you, who loves you and who died for you and rose from the dead? Which one is it? So, God has raised Jesus from the dead. Therefore, we are to look to Him as Savior and Lord of all. So, um, we have seen that God has shown us some things in Jesus. He has showed us the most important things. The resurrection of Jesus is everything to us, right? It is the thing that our life is founded upon. It is the very thing that our faith is founded upon. And therefore, we are to look to Him week in and week out in worship, Sunday to Sunday, and in between Sundays, we are to look to the resurrected one by giving Him all of our lives, right? Giving Him ourselves. Further, we have seen that we are to look to Jesus as Savior and Lord, right? He is Savior and He is Lord. He has been resurrected from the dead and He is Lord of all. And therefore, all of our life and all that we are is to be given to Him. So, friends, let's make it our aim to look into the resurrection of Christ. Today, and every day, more and more every day, from now until eternity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. He is the exalted Savior. He is the one who rules over 
all. He has conquered our sins. He has conquered our enemies. He has come to set us free. And he invites us to reign with him. Let us submit ourselves to Jesus Christ today, acknowledging his lordship, acknowledging that he is savior, that he is the one who he claimed to be. And let us be given to him in all things and not just some. Let us be serious about thinking about the things that we have put in his place, that we've allowed to have ownership in our lives, that, we, that we've allowed to lord over us. And let's get rid of these things. Let's put them to death. Give us grace to put them before you and sacrifice them on the altar. Get rid of them once and for all and follow Jesus. Let our lives be changed by the resurrection. Let us be redefined by the resurrection and all that it means to us. And let every person that we run into know that we are changed people and that we would invite them too to look into the resurrection of Jesus with us so that they might be changed with us. Let us be about this business. We thank you, Father, for the resurrection of Christ and all that it means to us and all that it does for us and all that it will be to us forever and for all eternity. We thank you, Father, for these things. We commit them to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Turn your eyes.